and then uh, bid you guys adieu here. Uh, good luck. So, uh, assuming this is actually sharing, that it is. Yeah, just got a series of slides here to just give a basic talk on uh, ZFS, how we use it, the basics of it. A lot of this is going to be pretty familiar uh, from the ButterFS uh, stuff from last week. But um, ZFS is a copy on write file system. It's a 128-bit file system that has snapshots, uh, volume management. One of the key uh, components is data integrity, uh, which is why I personally use it and evangelize it. Uh, it also features uh, inline compression and uh, deduplication. Um, ZFS started because Sun, uh, which is regrettably no longer with us, uh, had customers that had large storage needs. Uh, this was back, you know, early 2000s. They already had customers that were storing petabytes of data, and uh, they were worried about scaling, and they were worried about the functional lifetime of their current solution. Uh, so they decided to go ridiculous and make it a 128-bit file system. Uh, the um, little like blurb that gets thrown around a lot when you talk about this is Jeff Bonwick, who is one of the uh, principal architects of the file system. Uh, just crunching some numbers to demonstrate that a 128-bit file system should be sufficient in that assuming uh, like the maximum storage density that you can get with like hard drives, you need enough energy and be able to disperse enough heat to uh, run all of those that you would effectively like boil the world's oceans or whatever. Uh, mostly just as a joke, but yeah. So one of the key uh, important features of ZFS is data integrity. Uh, this is accomplished by what are called Merkle trees. Every block in uh, the file system is stored in a Merkle tree, which um, is a self-verifying uh, tree. Each uh, parent has the checksums of every child uh, in the tree. And since, you know, trees are a recursive data structure, if, if you each parent has the checksum for its children, and then each children has children, it's just self-validating all the way down the tree. Um, the uh, new uh, hotness right now, uh, cryptocurrencies like to call these blockchains, uh, but it's not exactly a new technology. Uh, yeah, no, not named for Angela Merkel. Um, so uh, one of the other killer features of ZFS is copy on write, uh, much like ButterFS, uh, every um, update, no data is actively overwritten. Uh, every new block is written to a new place and then the block pointer uh, is updated to refer to that block. Uh, so you can just take a snapshot of a data set in a point of time and instead of uh, you know freeing any uh, no longer referred to uh, blocks, they are referred to by that snapshot. So while you can continue writing new data, the data in its state at the point that that uh, snapshot was taken is still able to be referenced. So snapshots are effectively free uh, in that they don't really take any uh, space up until you start like deleting uh, data that's ref referenced by that snapshot. Uh, this also, uh, I'm not sure if I ever men mentioned it in these slides, but every operation in ZFS is atomic. Uh, so anytime you write data to the disk, uh, the file system will execute like the write that block to the disk in one instruction or, you know, as much as you can get in like C or whatever, and then update that the pointer to that block with one uh, instruction. So in, in theory and in practice, uh, the file system is extremely unlikely to ever be in an inconsistent state. Uh, so there's actually no need for a uh, file system check, really, because the file system is always going to be consistent. That doesn't mean that you can't have data loss. Um, if something is written to like the intent log, for example, 
uh, or something is in between transaction groups and not written to stable storage, it can be lost in the event of a power failure, but the file system will at least still be consistent. Uh, moving on, uh, snapshots. They are free. Uh, they are easy. They are intuitive. And uh, with send and receive, which allows you to send snapshots and receive them at a different location, a different system even, uh, it makes backup super easy. We store like a couple petabytes of data uh, that is backed up every night using incremental snapshots. Um, and it's just, it's super easy. You can take a snapshot and then if you take another snapshot, you can do an incremental send between them and it only sends the delta between those two snapshots. Uh, so it makes your backups only as big as the changes uh, in them. Uh, compression is another feature of ZFS that I really like. Uh, recently, they added Z standard, uh, which is written by the same person who made LZ4, uh, which is a really good compression algorithm. Z standard is basically better gzip. It's a lot faster uh, on writes and reads, uh, and it gets better compression ratios in the more most like reasonable versus like a reasonable gzip setting and not like gzip9. Gzip9 will probably still beat it. Um, LZ4 is the default compression algorithm that if you just turn compression on generically, and it's very fast, both for reads and writes, it's basically free. You'd be foolish to not turn it on unless your data is just completely incompressible. Uh, and even if it data is incompressible, there's not much of a penalty because it'll examine each block and then abort early if it finds out it's not compressible. Deduplication is another feature that ZFS has. Um, it's not widely used by a lot of people in production, uh, mostly because it has pretty serious performance implications because each time you write or read, or each each time you write or read, you need to refer to the uh, uh, hash table. And if it's not all in memory, you have to pull it off of the pool itself, which can be slow, but you've got to search through uh, that and then check if there's already one. If there is, you just update the reference to it instead of writing the block. Um, we use this in a few uh, things where performance isn't necessarily that big of a deal, and we haven't had any problems yet, but it's not as thoroughly tested as other parts anymore. Uh, so most people recommend not using it unless you have extremely deduplicatable data like in the case where we're using it as like VN images, which, you know, have a lot of commonality. Uh, so the basic structure of ZFS is a pool. Um, a pool is just a collection of devices, which in ZFS nomenclature are referred to as VDEVs. Um, there are a few types of VDEV. Uh, there's spans, mirror, and RAID Z. A span is like a RAID zero, basically. You just span data between devices in the pool. A mirror is exactly what it sounds like, like a RAID 1, uh, and you can add like any arbitrary number of uh, devices to a mirror. So if you have like 64 disks in an array, you could put, you know, like 32 of them in a mirror and then span that to another 32 wide mirror and have more data redundancy than anybody could reasonably want. Uh, and then there's RAID Z, which is a lot like RAID 5 uh, at the single uh, redundancy uh, level. You can, can ca you can throw all the drives in a pool together with that, and then you can suffer one disk worth of uh, you can suffer one disk's failure without losing any data. If you lose two, then you'll start having data loss. RAID Z2 adds another drive in there so you can suffer two drives worth of failure before you get any loss and then there's RAID Z3 which is as you would expect three. Um, DRAID was recently added which is declustered RAID. This is uh, the new hotness as far as RAID uh, goes. It's not too dissimilar conceptually from RAID Z. You can have the same parity levels in it but it distributes the that parity evenly amongst the pool and does some other stuff that I don't fully understand. Um, but you can, it gives you a little bit more control over like how much 
parity there is, how it's distributed amongst the drives, and it allows you to have distributed spares. Um, and you can nest all of these. So you could do a span of RAID Zs, a span of mirrors, a span of D RAID V devs. So, you, you know, you could do like a traditional RAID 10 or RAID 15 or 16 or whatever you want to call it, or other things too. Uh, data sets are what ZFS calls file systems. They're allocated from pools. Uh, and this allows you to just like divvy up the storage. Uh, ZFS functions a lot like a volume manager and a file system in one. And the fact that it unifies that functionality allows it to do a lot of powerful things. Uh, and then you can set what are called properties on the data set individually. Uh, as I mentioned, volume management is a thing. You can create uh, what are called Zvols. Uh, which are just block devices uh, that are still protected by whatever manner of redundancy that you've set up on the pool. The ZFS distribution that I use uh, until somewhat recently, the last couple of years, was called ZFS on Linux. Um, I've been using it since like 2013 or so. It's really nice. Uh, it's part of the Open ZFS project, and it's actually the upstream now. Uh, it used to be downstream of Illumos, but that changed recently. And the most current release is 2.1.1 as of this meeting. And uh, that supports up to kernel 5.15, I want to say, maybe 5.16. Um, I guess that bears mentioning, uh, unless you're canonical, uh, there is a perceived issue with distributing uh, ZFS as like a compiled product. Uh, since technically the GPL and the uh, uh, Sun Community Development, the CDDL, um, are not compatible. Uh, nobody's ever gone to court about this, and it realistically does not matter, but everybody's gun shy of Oracle going after them or whatever, um, since they own Sun now. But uh, basically, it, it has to be a kernel module, can't be distributed with the kernel. So you can just download. Um, it's built into where there are repositories for a number of the popular distros. Like there's one for Fedora and CentOS RHEL. Uh, Debian, uh, Ubuntu has it built in. Uh, but there's also one managed by the project for Ubuntu and Debian. Arch, Gen2, they've all got their own means of it. You basically download the source, and it's a DKMS module. Um, if you've worked with DKMS before, it's fine. Uh, I do have a basic demo I suppose I can do. Is that going through? I'm going to need to stop it first. I was able to see it. Okay. Yeah. It's Dirt. a little small, but it's there. I can embiggen it. Is that better? Yeah, that looks good for me. Anyone else? I'm seeing no complaints. That's fine. So. Good. Uh, this machine is just a build box for our software collection for the clusters, but it's a good enough illustration, and I can show the other ones later. Uh, but um, it has a, zinc a single Z pool on it, uh, which is made up of 24 uh, one terabyte SSDs and a DRAID 3. Um, this is mostly just used for scratch space. Uh, and this is me goofing around with uh, DRAID to evaluate it from a performance perspective, since this isn't a critical application. But you can see we've got a couple of data sets here. Uh, every time you create a Z pool, it creates a uh, data set for that pool. And then every other data set you create uh, is a child of that pool. Uh, a bunch of these here are from uh, Podman. Uh, creating uh, container overlays and stuff uh, with its storage driver. Uh, the ones that I've manually made are uh, 
just these. And the command for doing that's pretty simple. It's just CFS create and then the pool name and then the data set name. So you can see there's now a store example. And by default, uh, data sets mount off of the mount point of the parent. Uh, and the parent mount point is just slash store here. And you can see uh, we've now got an example directory there that refers to that. Um, properties are one of the more powerful features of ZFS and what I like in it versus ButterFS. Um, ButterFS, if you want to change how the file system behaves, it's generally like a mount option, which I find a bit onerous, at least coming from this world. Uh, with ZFS, you just set it as a property of the data set, and then it's there. You don't have to worry about how it was mounted or whatever. Um, there are a bunch of different properties. Um, some of them are user modifiable. Some are just there as a meet, as a matter of like reporting. Uh, useful ones are used or available or referenced. The difference between used and referenced is uh, used refers to all like the block data uh, used by the file system uh, in its current state, or yes, used by the whole file system. And then referenced is how much data the current state of the data set, data set references. So like if you have a bunch of snapshots that are using up space, your used may be higher than your referenced, like if you deleted data or whatever. And then you've got compression, which is probably the most important one from like a what you're commonly going to do with ZFS. You can change the compression uh, uh, algorithm and use there. Encryption's also important, but more so on uh, creation time than anything. Uh, there's man pages that describe everything for that. Um, and that you can change those fields just by doing a ZFS set and then the property name. So and we can change that to Z standard, for example, and then the data set. And you can see that that's now different for store example. You can also just get it for a single data set if you don't want to do everything. Um, and that just takes effect like that. And then it'll persist like that, regardless of like how it's imported or mounted, uh, unless you change it. Um, and takes effect for all data that's written from the point that you set that forward. Uh, so any data that was already on there, when be compressed with the previously defined compression algorithm uh, and the new stuff will be the new stuff. And then snapshots, the other killer feature, are really easy to do. Uh, you just do ZFS snap, data set you want to take a snapshot of, and then at, and then whatever you want the snapshot to be called. And instantly done. You can see that there are some snapshots taken now. Uh, and we have a test one visual or visible on a store example. Uh, demonstrate that here real quick, I guess. copied everything that begins with an S. Um, there's only 144 megs. Um, and here we can illustrate, you know, the gains for compression here. Uh, DU, uh, reports, uh, unless you do a parent size, uh, the actual disk usage. So in this case, that is the compressed uh, 
usage of the storage here. And then if we do the logical used, which tells you how much you're logically storing versus how much you're physically storing, you can see logically that data is 322 megabytes in size. But because we have the standard compression uh, in place here, uh, we're using like around half that. Um, we can just query that 2.27 uh, times compression here. So that's pretty good and also not unexpected for binary data. Um, so let's demonstrate the snapshot. So let's take another one. And then let's go ahead and just delete everything. It's all gone. Or is it? Well, oh, we've got this handy.zfs directory that's available at the root of every data set. And uh, in that, uh, you can see that we have two directories named test1 and test2, uh, which are the same names as the snapshots that were taken. Uh, if we look at test1, we can see since we took that when the directory was empty, empty we see nothing there. Look at test2, all of our data is still there. We refer to our get and reference here. Uh, you can see that's changed now. Uh, our used is still 143 megs, uh, but our reference is 67.9K. Uh, the current state of the file system is effectively empty, but since we still have a data or a snapshot of that data set, all of the data is still resident there in the pool. And if we wanted to selectively copy it back out, we could do that pretty easy. See, we've got that data back right now. Uh, if we wanted to, you know, if we did a fat finger and deleted everything like we just did there and we wanted to completely revert it, uh, got the ZFS rollback, I think is the actual. Yep, uh, rollback. So you just do That's two. And you can see the state of the file system is now that of that snapshot. Uh, snapshot management is extremely easy. Um, it's very powerful for backups. Um, the syntax for that is like, like yeah, why not? Uh, and then that would generate a send stream. And you can add a bunch of different flags to this, like this sends embedded data, uh, this sends compressed data. So the data isn't decompressed to send it across the wire, it just sends it in its already compressed state on the file system. And then you can pipe that to whatever you want. Uh, the backup thing that we do every night actually does it over SSH. So you just pipe that into SSH. And that would send it over SSH to uh, localhost, in this case, to a store.whatever data set. I don't think I have credential forwarding set up right now, so this probably won't work. It actually did. Uh, so you can see that we have a store slash whatever now, uh, which is effectively a copy of a store example. Uh, and that never uncompressed the data. It just sent that over SSH, which, you know, gets you encryption of that data stream if the data isn't already encrypted. Uh, and depending on the uh, cipher that you choose for SSH, you probably saturate line speed without significant CPU overhead, which is what we do. Um, You can do other dumb stuff with snapshots, not dumb. It, this is more like applicable in a VM situation or like a container situation. Say the snapshot of example was a VM image for whatever. Uh, you can clone them or you 
bucket type. Uh, that effectively did the same thing. Uh, we have cloned uh, that data set into a identical data set. And you'll note it's currently using zero bytes, but it refers to 143. That's because it is a clone <laughs> of this. So it's not actually using any data yet. It's just referring to the data that's already resident. Once we add data or delete data, it'll start, that number will change. Um, is there anything else anybody wants to see from this, it's generally pretty straightforward. What happens if you delete the .zfs folder? You can't, not allowed. Gotcha, so it, it it's it's like a sub mount that's read only, that's cool, okay. Yes, and this used to work, I think this has actually changed now, but you could, uh, CD into the snapshot directory and then make dir, and that would make a snapshot. I think that functionality has changed and I'm not surprised it was potentially abusable by end users. Gotcha. And um, then when you mentioned that it was uh, like, if you enable compression, it only does it for new stuff. So given mm -hmm. that it's copy on write, if you had yep. a file that already existed, you enable compression, you make a change to that file, that means that there are physically two copies on disk, one that's compressed and one that's not? Only the updated blocks. So like, say you had a one gigabyte file and you changed like a meg in it, it would, depending on the underlying block size of the file system, which is tunable, uh, only the changed blocks would be compressed. So you'd have like a thousand blocks that are the old uncompressed thing and like maybe 20 blocks that are the new compressed stuff, but it's still the same file structurally. It's just, gotcha. uh, if everything's done at a block level. Okay, okay. So it's not a file copy and write, it's a block. That makes sense. Okay, cool. Yeah. And this is open ZFS you are using, right? Yep. Do you, do you know if there are any differences between open ZFS and the, like the propriety ZFS, I suppose, like the BSDs use, you know? So the BSDs also use OpenZFS. Uh, oh. The only BSD like that wouldn't would be Solaris. Oh. Um, uh, all of them share a uh, common code or a, a historically common code base, like uh, OpenZFS uh, is a fork of ZFS as it was under Open Solaris uh, back in like 2000. 10 or whenever it was that Oracle gob gobbled up and then shot Open Solaris in the head. Um, so theoretically, if you have a ZFS uh, pool, volume, data set, whatever, uh, from that era of Open Solaris, uh, it would still be readable by Open ZFS today. Uh, it would complain that it was old, but you could still use it and if you created a file uh, pool very particularly right now, it could conceivably be usable in a similar system or even like a modern Solaris, but there is a pretty big divergence between the two anymore uh, with some features that were merged in in like the 2012, 2013 window, if I remember right, that just completely allow them to make all these different changes without having to worry about maintaining backward compatibility with the legacy product. And is it as stable as uh, or reliable as, uh, you know, ButterFS in like Linux systems or? I would say so. Uh, okay. We have been using it for production uh, workloads for five years now, and we haven't had any issues. Um, I think it's considered more reliable, more stable. Yeah. It, Everybody's definition of reliability uh, are different. Uh, some would argue that ZFS is more reliable or stable than ButterFS because the resiliency features, especially the multiple device uh, situation with ZFS is more mature than ButterFS. Um, ButterFS is The, the gone, big though. problem, of course, is, is this license thing that it's not going to be part of the kernel and uh, Linus Torvalds also is very anti 
And I'm just wondering if it hasn't occurred to somebody, let's do black box implementation of it and start from scratch. I, I suppose that would be a tremendous amount of work. That's effectively what ButterFS is. Like that was that was the design goal going out was them being like, damn, ZFS is really cool, but it's not GPL. Let's do a GPL version of it. Mm -hmm. um, they couldn't replicate the, they couldn't replicate the multi-drive features is not more like they just haven't gotten it down yet. I think is perhaps a fair way to put it. Not that they couldn't replicate it. Right. Um here um, the i i did hear a month ago there there is some movement to sort of finish btr file system to the things that aren't really working so well to sort of fix them up and um you know finally get everything working properly uh, you know i don't know how long it's it's going to take about a year or so they were saying and there may be some changes to the uh, structure of the data but um, I'm kind of crossing my fingers on that one. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens ultimately. But there's, so Oracle, or sorry, uh, Canonical uh, does not think the licensing argument is something that anybody should really care about. And I mean, they go and distribute uh, ZFS as a product with their Linux distribution. Granted, they're, uh, hand wiggling or, or about it a bit where um, they don't actually distribute it as part of the kernel. It's just a module that can be installed separately. Um, Linus isn't, I think, explicitly hostile towards open ZFS. They've made that distinction in the past. Uh, and sometimes when he talks about ZFS, he's talking about the Oracle product. Uh, not necessarily open ZFS, but realistically, it's probably never going to be relicensed. Like, I don't know if you've ever been involved in an open source project that's decided to relicense, but even with a small one, it's a really pain. It's a real pain in the ass. You've got to get, uh, you know, consent from everybody who's ever committed. And ZFS has a lot, or open ZFS has a lot of committers, and Oracle would have to, like, release all of their crap and then everybody who's ever made a change to open zfs would have to agree to a relicense and bleh. big mess probably never going to happen functionally doesn't matter uh the only time it's been a problem is when somebody in the kernel has decided that some kernel endpoint no longer should be uh open to non-gpl things and decides to restrict it to gpl uh compatible licenses or gpl only and it can break things like there was an issue uh, a couple of years back with uh, some changes in newer kernels restricting the kernel calls for doing like uh, setting up the uh, simd uh, the simd registers and using their op operations which you know like avx to avx sse that sort of stuff and that's what raid z and a few other operations in the kernel use to accelerate it uh, so that like killed encryption performance, for example, and it killed like RAID Z performance for a while there, but there was, they worked around it. So it's not a problem until it is a problem and then usually it's worked around. Shane, so, I did, sorry, go ahead. No. They're, they are no longer using the kernel implementations for those. No, they did some other stuff. How? <laughs> that, remade the functionality inside of ZFS itself, I believe. Well, and then the, the other, I guess I would say the other question about that is, is does it, does it really matter at a certain extent? Because I, I get the impression that, you know, things beyond the EXT series or maybe even XFS are sort of niche in a sense. Um, you know, ZFS, ButterFS, um, and all these others, because they're, they're kind of this in-between space, you know, where you're looking to scale larger than just like a single desktop unit, but you're not data center level. Sure, but your, your uh, encryption and SMID optimizations are used 
by everyone. And that's going to have a lot of eyeballs on it. Yeah. And then, it, cause you know, when you get to like big, big, big scale, I mean, you have people writing their own. I mean, Google wrote their own. Facebook wrote a couple of their own. Um, I'm guessing Amazon has written some of their own to, you know, manage across, you know, multiple devices and multiple regions and, you know, how that all ties together. So I, I guess even if there are licensing issues with, you know, including at mainline, I guess I don't know that that's actually an issue because the people that want to use it are going to be able to, whether it's, you know, DKMS or something else. And for the rest of the people, they've either got something on the large scale end that's, you know, even more distributed and scalable, or they're just, you know, a somewhat average desktop user like myself that has a bunch of individual machines that ext4 handles just fine so it's uh it, it's it's a cool thing to do but it's not necessarily something um needed or workflow breaking one of the things that i think sets it apart uh from xfs and ext series of file systems is the resiliency features like this protects you from bit rot random bit flips cosmic ray bullshit and it's self-healing as long as you have like redundancy in the pool somewhere like through raid z or mirrors or whatever like there's a there's maintenance stuff that you're supposed to do uh every um n amount of time whatever your uh feelings are about that uh called a scrub uh which goes through and it walks the tree that represents the whole file system and uh, checks them for consistency. ZFS also checks consistency every time data is accessed. So you touch a file, if any of those checksums fail validation, it'll automatically pull any good copies that it has. And if it doesn't have any, it'll let you know that it doesn't and the read will fail or whatever. Uh, so this pool isn't very big. Uh, it's doing a scrub now. It's about half done. going at a reasonable clip. Yeah, after after seeing this and the ButterFS presentations that we had, I'm going to have to um, play with it a bit. I've got a, I've got a server that I want to migrate my zone minder to, and it would be interesting to, to just just pick one and try it and see. See what happens. Well, yeah. you like a lot of things. Um, you know, the zone minder you just pointed at remote storage and it works if you don't have to migrate your actual zone minder box well i don't have to but the current zone minder box is interesting i i may i may also just add storage to the current zone minder box because it has that capability but i also have another server i could do both i could have one server be zfs and the other server be uh butterfs Shane, for the um, uh, for the RAID level, like multiple drive setup for ZFS or ZFS, yep. um, uh, you know, uh, can you use like consumer grades, uh, like um, uh, multi volumes, like based on like SATA interfaces, or yeah. do you need like RAID cards or like SAS, in fact, SAS just drive? having. Just having like a dumb HBA is actually the preferred method here because RAID gets in the way and can do dumb things that might affect the order in which data, you know, is dispatched to the drives. Mm -hmm. And is also more likely to just have issues because of the additional complexity of the controller. Um, it's recommended that you just have a dumb uh, JBOD uh, like HBA uh, and SAS or SATA works. You could do it with IDE even like it doesn't really care about you do a usb drives it doesn't care about the underlying uh connection that said uh there are some drives on the market right now that use the uh shingled uh, uh magnetic recording stuff and that because it can uh take a while for like reads to return uh can cause problems uh with zfs because it expects a you know drive to be fairly responsive and sometimes since those uh, single drives can have issues, there have been problems in people's pools where their like performance has just gone to crap or they've lost data. 
Two of questions. Bike. Those single yeah. drives are mechanical drives, I'm guessing, not uh, yes. SSDs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and the second question is, can you uh, explain what HPA is for this ignorant uh, person? Post bus adapter. So just like a, a PCIe card that, you know, has a bunch of SATA ports on it or SAS ports if it's a SAS card. Okay. But SATA does also work, you say? Yep. Yep. This box, these are just SATA SSDs, for example. Uh, our main stuff is uh, SAS, uh, which has a lot of, you know, like improvements in enclosures versus SATA, but that's not something that's necessarily going to be an issue for home users. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Did you see a uh, big bump uh, with 2.0? In performance or? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the optimizations and the, the L2, the things that they brought up in DFS. The big, the big feature that prompted me to update a handful of our main, like bulk, uh, super conservative scared to death if it ever breaks storage is still in the 0.8 six ish area um but less critical stuff i've gone to two and the main reason i did that was the z standard uh compression stuff um and purported just general performance increase stuff uh i haven't really run numbers there since uh none of it's hugely performance uh bound mostly just getting more storage out of it was the goal there Um, and the mic is my mic still on? Da, 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 da. Bloody Zoom works different than Slack. Um, the Panzer D dupe is that any better? Is that a new feature? Well, I honestly I don't follow it like you um i'm asking as in they they apparently opened panzura that's what panzer panzura one of the two um released code on their way of deduping it's supposed to be quicker it, I, I don't know if the OpenZFS has adopted it. That's hmm. looks like they might have presented on it last year at the summit. I don't know if it's made it in yet. Be because you brought up how um, dedupe is a performance hit, and I wonder if that. Um, I think there will always be a performance hit there just because you do have to do that lookup um, operation to see if there is already like deduplication, but you know, it could perhaps be lessened. If nobody has any other questions, I'll stop recording and I can show you some other things. Yeah, that works here. Do you have the button here? I can go ahead and stop. Go ahead and hit the button. Stopping recording.